Welcome to Redline Communications Going Wireless with Video Surveillance. I'm Duval Yeager. This is a presentation which discusses 10 important issues to be aware of when building a video surveillance network with wireless communications. It's targeted towards non-engineers and its goal is to explain a number of technical issues in a language that can be understood by all. This presentation focuses on video surveillance, but it's important to remember that this is only one of the five market focuses that Redline has. Redline focuses on backhaul, which moves large flows of data between two locations. Many times we think about backhaul as the ultra high speed network that connects cellular phone towers, and this is indeed an application. However, any large network can be backhauled. For instance, a university hospital complex located a mile or two from the main university campus may have a large video surveillance network. The university may want to connect this video surveillance network to its university network. The, the two networks could be connected by a main backhaul link. Private networks would be any use of wireless to connect buildings or remote locations this can be thought of as a private network. Video surveillance obviously extends security networks in cities, airports, and border crossing. Video surveillance has become main, one of the main applications for development in Redline's research and development labs today. Business access is where a telecom service provider wants to offer high-speed data services to corporate and enterprise customers. Business access services require a much different radio technology than residential internet services. Data acquisition, which is also called machine-to-machine -machine connectivity, is an in done, usually done in an industrial setting, such as the energy sector, like digital oil fields, or monitoring resources, like a city's water or sewer so services. Redline has found that because of certain specific demands that these solutions have, traditional wireless technologies such as Wi-Fi, WiMAX, or LTE are not always well suited to their needs, and this is why we've specialized in them. For video surveillance, Redline focuses on two radios in particular, the AN80i and the RDL3000. Both radios are software-defined radios, which can be software-upgraded and changed. They have data capacities per sector of 50 and 120 megabits per second, respectively. The range of these radios at full capacity is what gives them the market leadership. Better range at full capacity means less towers, more area covered, and more high-resolution cameras can be installed. The AN80i features the ability to be installed with only optical line of sight, while the RDL3000 can operate in complete non-line of sight conditions. Both offer software upgrade for growth and capacity increase and an incredibly low sub-3 millisecond sector latency. Both process at wire speed and have unparalleled security, ruggedness, and mean time between failures. There are five issues that make video challenging under any network conditions. This presentation will discuss multicast, data flow, latency, small packets, and metadata to show why these need to be understood well for good network performance. Moreover, they have a more profound effect on a wireless network. There are five radio issues that make designing a wireless video network challenging. Range, line of sight, system growth, security, and ruggedness are special requirements that in many cases are unique to the video surveillance network. The first topic we'll discuss is multicast. Multicast is a type of networking communication used by regular wired Ethernet networks to send certain information to multiple nodes or computers on the local network. 
Through multicast, a single node can send a single transmission, which is then received by a number of other computers simultaneously. Video surveillance manufacturers have taken advantage of multicast to lower the overall requirement for data on a video surveillance network. In other words, less capacity is required. If multiple computers need to see video from the same camera, they use multicast to achieve this. The video cameras use multicast to transmit their video streams when multiple locations require to view their film simultaneously. This means that a 2 megabit per second video stream takes a total of 2 megabits per second capacity from the network, even though three console control sites are viewing it. However, most wireless systems were designed for internet access, where each node is a subscriber of internet services. In this type of network, subscribers re receiving other subscribers' transmissions could be catastrophic, since they may contain sensitive emails or banking transactions. Manufacturers of these wireless systems have disabled multicast and in some cases even designed their systems around a unicast-only system. If a wireless system does not support multicast, the video stream must be sent as three separate unicast transmissions. This takes a total of 6 megabits per second of network capacity. For a wireless system to support video surveillance efficiently, it really must support multicast. But multicast can quickly become a mess if every camera is transmitting to every other node on the system. Here you see a base station where all cameras are transmitting to all monitoring stations and all other cameras as well. Obviously, this would, be, this would cause problems as the system grows. For this reason, VLAN segmentation is a must. VLANs allow you to create multicast groups within your network so that instead of everyone receiving all of the data, each node receives only the data which pertains to its multicast group. Note that you could also make certain nodes members of multiple VLAN groups. This would allow a monitoring station to see cameras from multiple groups. Video data flow is our next topic. The flow of video traffic is extremely bursty. This is because the camera films in images or still photographs called frames. When a camera is powered on, it takes a photograph of everything in its viewfinder and transmits this image as an iframe to the video server. The iframe is transmitted to the server at 100 megabits per second and takes several microseconds to upload. This is represented on the graph to the left. If 100 megabits per second is not available on the network, the iframe will be discarded. This is a problem since the iframe image is the benchmark that the video server uses to compare against the following images that it will receive. So the server will request that the camera reshoot and retransmit the iframe until it's received. The higher megapixel the camera, the larger the iframe will be. After the iframe is transmitted, the camera goes completely silent, as shown. Once the iframe is stored on the server, the camera divides the viewing area into squares like a piece of graph paper. Each of these squares are called microblocks. This is kind of an art artistic rendition since there are actually thousands of microblocks in the viewing area. The camera looks for movement in any of the viewing area. Microblocks that have movement are compressed using a predictive movement algorithm. For this reason, this image is called a P-frame. The P-frame is a small file that contains only the movement within select macroblocks. P frames are also op uploaded at a quick 100 megabit per second burst, but they're very small packets since it's very small movement. Around 80% of the data transmitted from a video camera are P frames, 
which explains why modern video is predominantly very small packets. The combination of iframes, p-frames, and silence yield an average bandwidth, which is what camera manufacturers calculate in technical information for network capacity calculations. But it should be clear that a 2 megabit per second camera does not transmit a 2 megabit per second flow of data. Rather, it transmits 100 megabits per second data showers in between periods of silence. Data flow from a video camera is very bursty. Networking equipment, such as radios, were not typically designed to handle such bursty traffic. To better support the bursty nature of video, Redline has built in memory buffers into the radio. When an iframe data shower hits our radio, these packets can be cached into memory for a few microseconds until the sector or base station has capacity to support this data shower. This buffering allows for the smooth uploading of video traffic without loss of any iframes. The result is the ability to support higher resolution cameras which have very large iframes. Redline has demonstrated the ability to support 16 megapixel cameras filming 30 images per second. Latency can be very important in video surveillance when communication between camera, server, and control units is required. This is the case when moving a camera via a control interface like a PTZ or via motion detectors. It's even more important for video analytics like license plate recognition, shape recognition such as identifying a truck or a bus, or color recognition like look for a red car. In all of these cases, the information captured in the field must be sent to the server for processing and then commands sent back from the server to the field so that action be t can be taken on server commands. In the time that a regular broadband radio can send data from a camera to a server, typically 12 milliseconds, Redline can send data from camera to server and back four times. This means that cameras move quickly and smoothly and analytics perform instantaneously. The next issue we want to discuss are small packets and packet processing. Video surveillance is transmitted in small packets. We saw that in the slide about the P-frames. This causes a bottleneck at the radio's central processor and slows down the network. But this is a difficult topic to explain, so I'm going to use a parallel we can all relate to, expressway traffic flow. Assume an expressway has enough lanes and speed to support a thousand passengers per minute. Now assume that to pay for the expressway we need to charge a toll. Toll booths can become a bottleneck to traffic flow, so let's design the booth efficiency to support our traffic flow. If we construct 10 toll booths and each toll booth can charge two tolls per minute, we can support 20 tolls per minute, or 10 times 2. If, if the standard bus can hold 50 passengers and our toll booths can support 20 tolls per minute, that's 1,000 passengers per minute, or 20 times 50 equals 1,000. But if everyone rides in a car at an average of 2 passengers per car, we can only support 40 passengers per minute using the same math. 
increasing the speed of the expressway or adding lanes will not make traffic go any faster. We're limited to pass to 40 passengers per minute because that's the limit of our bottleneck, our toll booth. The only way to alleviate, alleviate the bottleneck is to, allow, is to add more toll processing. In this case, 500 tolls per minute. The same is true of networking equipment, bridges, routers, and especially radios. Let's say my radio can function at 100 megabits per second. As packets come into the radio, they need to be processed. But the radio is only concerned with the header. The size of the data payload does not affect the time it takes to analyze the header, just like a toll booth takes the same amount of time to collect from a car as it does from a bus. This means that if all the data comes into your radio in big packets, say 1500 byte packets, your CPU only needs to process 8,333 packets per second. But if the data comes in in small 64 byte packets, the CPU needs to process over 195,000 packets per second in order to create 100 megabits per second in data flow. If it can do this, the device is said to operate at wire speed processing. But that's 23 times the processing power. Everyone that's purchased a PC and seeing how just 10% increase in CPU speed can affect the price can understand why certain radio manufacturers might not make the investment in more processing unless it's absolutely necessary. The market for Wi-Fi, WiMAX, and LTE radios is very, very price sensitive. So this is an area where manufacturers can easily overspend if they're not careful. Let's take a look. In this table, we have a number of different IP applications and the size of packets that are normally associated with this application. The first three applications in the gray box are basic file transfer and internet usage, like file sharing. These are all quite large packet sizes, since in each case the network is trying to send a fairly large amount of data and tries to use the largest payload it can to do so. The applications in blue are voice used using different compression standards. These can use anywhere from 64 to 214 packet sizes as long as the user is on the phone. Obviously these are small amounts of data and they're transmitted in small packets. The three applications in red are video. Recall from the slide on keyframes that video is predominantly small packets. So if you were designing a wireless product like Wi-Fi and you knew that the main applications were those in gray, why would you overspend on a processor? The answer is, you wouldn't. This graph shows the effect of small packets on a Wi-Fi chipset which processes at 35,000 packets per second. I've used this number because it's the fastest Wi-Fi wi chip currently on the market manufactured by Atheros. You can see by this graph that below 1,000 byte packets, the processing becomes a bottleneck. Let's be careful. This is not a criticism of Wi-Fi. Remember that the main application for Wi-Fi is internet and file sharing. So the technology is designed to meet that requirement. The next topic on our list is metadata. Each video file is made up of frames which need to be associated to metadata. The metadata contains the camera identification, the exact time, date, frame number, and often other information. The metadata is stored in the video server and associated to the video stream it represents. If the metadata for a video file is lost, the video cannot be used as evidence in court. For this reason, many say that the metadata is more important than the video itself. But cameras do not mark metadata as time-sensitive or prioritized data packets like they do with video. 
To show this, let's start with how QoS works. When a camera creates a video packet, it puts a tag on the packet header with a high priority queue for video. There are many standards a camera can use to do this, such as 802.1p, TOS, or DiffServe. Different packets have different priorities that depend on the application. As packets arrive at the radio, they're put into queues or lines depending on their priority. The radio then transmits all of the packets from the highest queue first before transmitting fr from the next queue. But when there are network problems, such as interference in the unlicensed spectrum, the radio, faced with more packets coming in, will drop the data in the low priority queue. And this is how our precious metadata gets lost. This is because metadata is not given any QoS priority. It leaves the camera tagged as simple data. Redline allows important metadata to be separated into a service flow and then double VLAN tagged via Q and Q with the highest priority. This means metadata is never lost. So let's review our list of five video issues. Redline offers excellent capacity, support for multicast, buffers to cache video iframes, the industry's lowest latency, wire speed processing, and a way to prioritize metadata so that it doesn't get dropped. Wi-Fi offers less bandwidth over 20 megahertz than our RDL 3000, and while it does support multicast, it cannot cache iframes, has high latency, and cannot process at wire speed nor save your metadata. WiMAX is, is even less suited for video. This is mostly because it has very poor uplink speeds and suffers, suffers from very high latency. So maybe we should take a break in the middle of our presentation and look at the AN80i. It's a high speed, low latency radio with 50 megabit per second per sector capacity and sub 3 milliseconds latency. It processes at wire speed, so man no matter what size the packets, it's going to run just as fast. And it has great power for excellent range. The AN80i is available in the 49 to 58 gigahertz range of frequencies, as well as the 33 to 38 gigahertz. And it's also available in many channel bandwidths to make efficient use of the available spectrum. The RDL 3000 in re is Redline's new flagship radio. It's 120 megabits per second over 20 megahertz channel and is the industry's highest speed radio. Like the AN80i, it has low latency, wire speed processing, and is available in the same frequencies. The RDL 3000 also offers MIMO A functionality and the industry's highest power radio for true non-line of sight performance, even at long range. But most importantly, Redline radios have been specialized to address the many points discussed in the first part of this presentation. We support video multicast, a must for modern video technology, and we VLAN tag for multicast groups. We have increased buffers so there's no discarded iframes, and sub 3 millisecond latency means improved video analytics and fast and smooth pan tilt zoom. We process at wire speed, and we offer service flows and Q and Q, so there's no lost metadata. Redline has really studied the requirements of video, and we really understand how to make it work well over wireless. So let's look at the radio issues we discussed. The first radio issue on our list is range. Range is important, and so is throughput. If you're a service provider and you're designing a wireless network, you probably have quite a few towers you can install on. But if you're a city or a municipality or a private company, installing towers is not an inexpensive project. In fact, it'll probably be the highest line item on your whole budget. 
Redline radios have much better performance characteristics. This means that their highest speed, they have much better range. The RDL 3000 can support up to six miles at its highest speed. The ANADI can support up to four miles at its highest speed. If we look at Wi-Fi, WiMAX, and LTE, we see that the speeds drop off very rapidly and although in the case of Wi-Fi very good speeds can be achieved the capacity drops off at very low range. The next issue on our list is line of sight. So let's explain the three different conditions of line of sight. The first one is clear line of sight. This is where not only is do I have line of sight, but the space in between the radios called the Fresnel zone is completely open. This is a concept that a radio doesn't transmit like a laser beam, but rather in a stream of energy that comes out like a cone. In single carrier radios and spread spectrum radios, 60% of this cone of energy needs to be clear of obstacles. So if there's a building in the, in the middle, not only do I need to be able to see over that building, but I need to get enough height so that this Fresnel zone can also be clear. In an example of a 31 kilometer or 19 mile link, a 150 foot tower or 45 meter tower would be required. Radios that require optical line of sight mean that you only need to be able to see the antenna. So if you put your eyeball behind the antenna on the building at the left, you'd be able to see the antenna on the right, even though you didn't have a clear Fresnel zone. OFDM radios such as the ANADI and WiMAX and Wi-Fi radios all support optical line of sight. MIMO A radios support non-line of sight and non-line of sight is exactly what it sounds like. It's the ability to make a link even when you can't see the radio or the antenna on the other side. The way this is done is not by shooting through the building in the middle but by bouncing off of adjacent buildings. This explains why you can't get non-line of sight through a mountain but you can certainly get non-line of sight around buildings in a metropolitan setting. So let's talk about how MIMO A and MIMO B work. MIMO A is where a device has two radios. The radios send identical data and this functions kind of like you have two eyes. By having two eyes you have better depth of field perception close one eye and you don't have the same depth of field perception. Same thing with your ears. Close one of your ears and you can't hear where sound is coming from quite as easy. By having two radios the device is able to receive a reflection of the original signal and be able to decipher the actual data. MIMO A is available in the RDL 3000 it's also available in LTE and WiMAX products. MIMO Matrix B is where the radio has two transmitters and excellent propagation characteristics. In other words, it probably has very good line of sight and a very good signal reference. When it can do this, it uses the two radios to send separate data streams. In other words, it's sending different data from one radio than the other. This doubles your data throughput. Radios that use MIMO B are the RDL 3000, LTE, WiMAX, and also Wi Fi. So when you hear a Wi Fi product saying they support MIMO, they're half right. MIMO Matrix B gives Wi-Fi the incredible speeds they have, especially at close range, because Matrix B requires 
excellent signal quality. However, Wi-Fi radios do not support MIMO Matrix A. Our next topic is system growth and the idea is we always want to grow a video surveillance network. By having a radio that upgrades via software we're able to grow our network more comfortably without replacing the hardware. New camera manufacturers are now discussing software upgradable cameras. In other words, new video cameras can be increased from 2 megapixels to 4 or even 6, six megapixels simply through software upgrades. For the same reason, it's very important to have radios that offer the same capacity growth flexibility. In government projects where budgets are assigned on an annual basis, there may not be the budget this year for the full size that the network will grow to in coming years. So it's important to have a radio that can be purchased for a lower cost up front and then software upgraded to higher speeds for additional fees in the future. No one comes close to Redline in security. Our high, high security rating has led us to become the most deployed commercially off-the-shelf broadband radio in the history of the U.S. Department of Defense. We offer many types of encryption including 256-bit AES. We offer many types of authentication keys including public or private X509 and of course FIPS 140-2 certification. And Redline is the undisputed leader in reliability. Our radios are built to the strictest of environmental standards and include components with a 29-year mean time between failure rating. We have the highest temperature ratings and our casings are made of B928 marine grade aluminum. This is a high magnesium content aluminum that doesn't corrode in salty environments. We also powder coat finish our radios rather than just spray paint them. So let's see how Redline stacks up on our five radio issues for video surveillance. Our range is 6 kilometers for the A and ADI or 8 kilometers at the highest capacity, optical or non-line of sight, software upgradability, high security, NEMA 6X ruggedness, and 29 years mean time between failures. Wi-Fi and WiMAX, because they're not industrialized solutions and they're not specialized for the uplink of video traffic, don't have the same characteristics. So the bottom line red line for video more capacity and longest range. This means less towers and more cameras with less radios. We offer MIMO A for true non-line of sight, software capacity growth, all of our radios are specialized for video and we have the industry's best security and most robust radio. Redline Communications, the most powerful, versatile, and reliable radios offer the lowest lifetime cost. Thank you for listening.